Welcome back. Welcome back. And now we are um, we, we we really enjoyed the late the, the last panel and uh, uh, conferences like AWE are so important because there's a great international community of people trying to uh, make uh, make a breakthrough from this fascination uh, that they got some sometime in their lives for augmented and virtual reality and uh, to see it coming beca becoming mainstream is uh, is uh, so emotional for all of us and uh, and uh, remaining on um, the creators uh, there are the main um, there are the protagonists of this uh, track. I, I'm uh, here to introduce our next speaker. He's uh, Daniel Plemons, and he will, uh, uh, and he's a uh, senior interaction designer at Microsoft, and he will uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, an, uh, an XR Creator Tools Manifesto. So please welcome Daniel Plemons on our virtual stage. Hey, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for uh, taking the time to listen today. I'm Daniel Clemens. I'm a technical interaction designer. Mostly, I work on mixed reality experiences or really anything that involves kind of strange uh, or novel user interfaces. Uh, which means I spend a lot of time using various tools to try and either envision applications or, or produce them. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about why I feel like I really need a new hammer. Uh, or maybe even more accurately, what I really need is a new pencil. So before I jump into that, just the, the quick disclaimer that these are all my own opinions, not necessarily those of my employer. Uh, so if you think all of this is pretty silly, well, that's just on me. Uh, but zooming out a little bit, tools are super impactful things. They really have defined humanity throughout history. There's a reason we talk about uh, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Information Age, the materials that our tools are made of. And they, they, they shape our world. And as creators, they shape the things that we create, uh, probably more than really we want to admit. And in particular, if a tool makes something hard, we won't experiment or be creative along that axis. We'll set the first thing we have and we'll, we'll move on from there. Uh, my example here is Adobe After Effects, which is an incredible production tool uh, for video and, and effects, and it's one I use a lot. But I'm also not particularly good at it. And so when I go into After Effects, I go into the production mindset. I know what it is I want to create, uh, and I have a plan for how I'm going to do that, and then, then I execute that plan. The tool empowers me to create my vision. Uh, but take a, a, a little bit of a different tool, a tool made for experimentation, something like Vine. Uh, if you don't remember Vine, it was a mobile application that allowed you to just point and tap and hold with your, uh, with your phone to quickly capture and cut uh, little eight-second repeating videos. Uh, and it made that very, very easy. So when a tool makes something easy, what we see is this incredible explosion of creative output from people. And it's not necessarily from people who would have otherwise been using video or, or whatever the, the tool's medium is as a medium for expression. With Vine, we saw this huge explosion of new things. And that's a big part of why I'm so excited about mixed reality. We have the privilege of getting to build tools and experiences for people that change how they relate to the world around them, the, the people and the challenges around them. Uh, and that's, a, that's an awesome experience. And so building tools for others is, is a big, cool opportunity. But we also use tools ourselves, right? As creatives, we, we, use, the, we use these things to, to build those experiences. And the tools we use are pretty different, that, or the tools we need are pretty different than the tools we have today, because mixturality-based design is pretty different than traditional screen-based. Uh, let's look at an example from Microsoft's uh, Dynamics 365 Guides, which is a training application for the HoloLens. What I want you to pay attention to is all of the things happening in here that we just never see in traditional 2D applications. 
reacting to her as she moves throughout the space, as uh, her eyes move around, she looks at different things, attaching and anchoring to the environment that is changing around the application. There's a lot going on here that we don't traditionally have to think about it when we're working on a 2D application. And I'm gonna paint with a really broad brush here, but screen-based design is largely static. Whereas mixed reality design tends to focus on these like dynamic and reactive behaviors, uh, responding to all of the, the different things that are changing in the world around the application. A designer I used to work with at Leapmotion described it as a, a matrix of complexity. Of course, we have to deal with the UI and the application state, just like any other application. But we're also thinking about the view distance. We're thinking about the, the human input that's constantly moving and changing. Uh, we're thinking about the ergonomics, making sure it's comfortable and safe. We're thinking about the, the field of view of the device and reacting to a changing environment all around us. And this means that even the most basic thing, like where do I put a menu in 3D space, becomes a relatively nuanced design exercise uh, that requires a, a fair bit of thinking. And to deal with this, uh, mixed reality is UI is really built with layers of rule systems and constraint solvers and custom, you know, highly crafted behaviors. And we tend to express these with computer code. Uh, this is largely what I spend my time doing is trying to figure out how to uh, translate uh, computer code into uh, experiences in mixed reality. But even for someone like me who spends all of my time doing this, it's a precise expression, but it's not easy to reason about. Um, and it becomes a huge blocker to a lot of people who want to come in and be able to start building mixed reality experiences and expressing themselves with the medium. Uh, and that's a, that's a big problem for us. Let's compare that to a pencil sketch or a whiteboard sketch. It can really capture the, the true essence of a screen experience. Uh, if I do a quick mock-up with a pencil of uh, a 2D mobile application, that really does give me a pretty great idea of how that's gonna feel, how it's gonna look. The visual fidelity might not be there, but the core of the experience is. And that's very, very powerful. It lets me validate my ideas to myself. It also lets me communicate them with others. Uh, I can sit with a group of other people on my team and sketch on a whiteboard or around a sheet of paper, and we are, we're going to build shared understanding really quickly. Now, let's compare that to mixed reality. These are some sketches I did for uh, an MR application uh, a few years back, and while they do convey information about my design, they don't properly express the, the essence of those experiences. You can't understand how that's going to behave over time or how that menu is going to feel. Uh, it just doesn't you know, get to the essence of the experience and realistically it can't. So in a lot of ways as, as mixed reality creators, we've lost our pencil. And it's important to remember that that's one of the most accessible tools we have. It's the tool that almost anyone can pick up and start to learn and use to express themselves. And so that's a huge blocker to bringing in a, a more diverse and larger group of creators, which our medium is going to need as it matures and grows. And uh, we wanna make sure that that's a, a healthy ecosystem. And so this is something we really need to think a lot about. So let's go back to that guides video. Um, and let's think about what would it take to create a tool that allows you to catch uh, these ideas quickly, uh, to validate them and communicate them with others so that you can you know, be creative and solve the, the various UI challenges in, in an application. Um, we really do need a tool like this uh, if we're gonna be able to kind of progress the medium forward. So what would this tool look like? I don't think there's anything on the market today that I've seen that really checks all the boxes for me. But I do think there's a lot of things that are happening and they're out in the world that we can use as a reference to start to talk about what should this tool look like? What might the requirements be? So let's break down some of those requirements. In my mind, I first jumped to Figma. Figma is a tool for 2D page design and layout, largely focused on web and mobile. And one of the most fantastic things about it is that it supports real-time multi-user collaboration. 
Uh, multiple people can go open the document and see in real time as uh, people change and update uh, the design. And it means that you can get very fast, very quick, uh, very efficient feedback loops where a team can work together and build a design and generate shared understanding. And so I think we have to say that uh, any MR pencil uh, would have to be multi-user. And while we're, we're building this, I think we have to be building in device. Uh, when I use something like Microsoft's maquette or any of the other 3D uh, content creation systems inside of uh, MR devices, um, that gives me a huge amount of power because I can immediately see my design in the medium it's intended for. It helps me move much more quickly. And just like a pencil can capture the essence of a 2D page experience, I can start to capture the essence of how my content will feel in 3D using a tool like this. So that's really of critical importance. So we have to say that our MR pencil is, is natively an MR. Optimally, we would support many platforms so that I could do some things on desktop, some things on mobile. But I think really we have to think MR first. The next thing, and this might get a little more contentious, is uh, we need to bring the real world into our application. This is Timothy West talking about Unity's Project Mars. And one of the cool things they've done in Mars is they brought a model for the real world into the editor so that you can bring all of the, the various diversity of the real world into your creation experience without having to necessarily take a device and go to all of the different environments that you might be in. And so this allows a creator to define the rules and define the behaviors they want around uh, various real world geometry. And so this is really powerful because, and really important, uh, because the real world is such a critical part of the mixed reality experiences we create. So any MR pencil really has to model the real world. Uh, but then we start thinking about, wow, that's a lot of variation. Um, anyone who's built a, an application that has to uh, deal with a seated user uh, or maybe a user in a VR arcade and at a warehouse scale and adapt to all of those, all the things in between, knows that content needs to squash and stretch. And so I look at something like side effects software's Houdini, where all of the content is defined in a programmatic and parametric way. And that allows uh, a creator to build content that can squash and stretch and adapt to a variety of different environments and can uh, kind of work into whatever state it needs to be in. And so I think as we think about what is the MR pencil going to act like, well, it needs to be parametric and it needs to be adapted. Uh, so now I'm getting pretty complicated. I suspect some of the engineers are uh, you know, sitting here going, yeah, well, this is this is not going to work. This is really difficult to build. Um, but let me just add one one more thing to make it even harder, and that's that I don't think we can use code in this in this MR pencil. Uh, this is Chalk Talk by Ken Perlin, and in this example, Ken uh, he is able to use a bunch of symbols and linking lines to create relatively complex. Uh, interactive relationships between elements here, um, and he actually does it all in 3D, which is very cool. And while there's some things about Chalk Talk that I think are a little ambitious, I, I think it speaks to the fact that we need to think about different modalities for how people are going to define all of these systems. And I don't believe it really can be computer code. Code is this huge barrier to bringing in more creators into our space. And it really is this layer of abstraction between the thing we want to create and the thing that we're going to build. And so rather than thinking about the core mechanics of how something works, what we really want people to do is express what they want the interaction to feel like, what they want the experience to be like. And so I really believe that an MR pencil has to be no code. But then how do we do that? Um, how do we actually, like anyone who's uh, worked with no code systems, especially visual programming system knows they often devolve into of these spaghetti graphs of nodes and linking lines. Well, I look at something like Cascadeur, which is a really cool physics-based animation system. Uh, in Cascadeur, the animator, just like traditional animation, sets a bunch of keyframes, but then a, a physics simulation behind the scenes handles the in-betweens and creates a much more uh, naturalistic expression. 
And when I watch this video of this workflow, what I'm struck with is how much it feels like the animator is sculpting, uh, kind of in collaboration with the engine. Uh, the animator says, all right, I need you to get from here to here, uh, and I want a little bit of a flip. Uh, and then just refines what the engine is creating and kind of guides it towards their intended behavior. And I'm really struck with this idea of can an MR pencil let creators sculpt behavior rather than precisely defining it uh, and working collaboration with uh, an underlying system. So what this might look like is I have a menu uh, and I want that menu to follow me. And so I say, okay, follow my head. And then as I move around, I say, well, in this situation, I want you to be here. And maybe as I move in a different way, I want you now to be over here. And I can start to sculpt the interaction I want rather than having to define it with a very precise rule system. And I believe that while that may not have the precision of code, it will give uh, creators uh, a lot more expressibility and a lot better ease of use. And I believe that there's a, there's a real opportunity to let people sculpt the behaviors they want rather than define them. So, Coming up, an MR pencil needs to be multi-user so that teams can collaborate quickly and build shared understanding. It needs to be natively MR so that as we're creating, we really capture the essence of how it's going to, uh, how our application is going to work in the actual device. It needs to model the real world because the real world, how our MR applications work, that needs to be a part of our initial envisioning. It needs to be no code, so it's easily learnable and accessible and expressive to as wide a group of people as possible. It needs to let people sculpt behaviors so that they can focus on the experience they're trying to create rather than the underlying mechanics and rules of how that system is necessarily working. And while we're thinking about all of this, we can't lose sight of the fact that production-focused tools don't really lend themselves to experimentation as well as simpler tools that are focused on ease of use. And creative problem solving really can thrive in a tool that is built around ease of use, uh, just like a pencil. And I don't know about all of you, but as a, as a mixed reality creator, I really want my pencil back. Uh, so thank you all so much for the time and uh, we'll do some Q&A now. I want my pencil back too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, you. illuminating, but looking at the, the comments, uh, you, you addressed uh, a lot of topics uh, that uh, uh, XR creators are, uh, are, uh, are facing uh, and a lot of challenges. So uh, is there something that you would like to add after looking at your presentation from Another perspective. Uh, I think the the big thing that I've been thinking about uh, with with all of this has really been uh, what does you know what what is that language? What is that way of um, describing interactions that um, that is that is this low code or no code system? What is that What is that going to look like? I've been I've been spending a lot of time. Um, researching kind of future of code or future of, of, of computer programming communities and, and trying to see kind of what, what's happening in the world, looking at things like Max MSP um, or pure data or, or systems like that. And um, processing. I, I, the big open question for me is, is what does that, that editing environment and semantic system look like? Um, and that, that, that's still in a lot of ways a mystery to me. So, you know, if, if my big question, I suppose, to the community at large is, you know, what are the what are the touch points and what are the touchstones that other people see for how we might start to articulate this? Because there is this idea that I love of sculpting a behavior um, and being able to um, kind of guide a system towards towards the solution that I'm looking for. Uh, but it's going to have to be some hybrid of, of that sort of learning plus semantic definition. And so I. Uh, that, that to me is the is the big problem to still solve. No, it's really interesting how you mentioned the, some platforms that have have a great value because they're mixing communities. So we don't have just coders, but we have multidisciplinarity 
uh, entering in the field of, uh, of high technology, I would call it. So people playing with HoloLens, people, exp it's all about expectations and, uh, and uh, democratization of uh, creation tools and also a good environment for good ideas to emerge from the many standard uh, and gimmicky, I would say, uh, applications that we all know. So, and it, it was really interesting because you introduced uh, a lot of uh, prototyping platforms or innovative uh, uh, things that, that somehow um, made the creativity bloom, like Vine. That was, was a cool example. We have some questions and uh, James is asking, you say pencil, but do you really mean sculpting tools? was metaphoric, but something that can allow you to use your hands to shape the interactions in AR and VR? Um, the, I think it's a really interesting metaphor with, with sculpting tools and being able to have that embodied experience. Um, I, I, for one, like loved when I was in art school, being able to stand at an easel with a, with a huge canvas and be able to really have an embodied creative experience. And I think for a lot of people, that's a great way to uh, express themselves creatively. So I do really enjoy these sorts of, um, you know, fully physical and embodied creation tools. But really for me, the pencil metaphor is uh, about that ease of being able to get an idea into a form where I can understand it, where I can experience it in a way that is um, true to its final form. And so that idea that with a, with a 2D application, a pencil sketch can give me uh, a facsimile of my experience that is relatively easy for me to reason about, whereas in mixed reality, that's very difficult today, especially with a moving or dynamic system. Um, it's very difficult for me to, to quickly uh, mock that up. Um, and, I, and for a non-programmer, it's nearly impossible. They have to collaborate often with, with, a, with a coder um, or someone who can, or someone who knows something like Houdini really well and can start to build these dynamic systems. So, the, the really critical part of the pencil metaphor for me is that um, that like very, very fast loop to something that expresses the idea um, true to form. Uh, but I, I love those embodied experiences. And I do think that, especially in mixed reality, which is such an embodied platform, that that idea of a sculpting tool uh, is really important to the final experience. Yes, you're, you're right. And there are so many tools that are emerging and they are all creating small communities. I, I'm sure you know the, the, the Quill community that is a, is a product that, uh, that was born like a, a test from two creatives from Oculus and now it's, uh, it's growing and, and it's, it, it's growing in its grammar and uh, structure and it's becoming a tool. So. And yeah, Consuelo is asking all the recent Sorry. work in Dreams too. Um, that's been that's been awesome to see um, a lot of that kind of going viral in the community. Yes, yes, and I remember uh, moderating a, tr a track last year, and Goro Fujita was uh, in this uh, in this track, uh, this creator track you're you're in uh, today. So Consuelo is asking. Uh, when do you see this new pencil that will be available and who are the best player that could deliver it? Uh, the no code the part is fundamental if the industry want to get pure designers bringing innovations as well. Um, so who do you see is going to create the, the tool? That's a Microsoft. really tough question, um, especially in, a, in an industry like ours that's so new and, and evolving so quickly. Um, I, I have a suspicion that it will largely come out of the community. Um, there's, there's part of the way I structured the talk was trying to look at a bunch of things happening across the entire, you know, mixed reality, augmented virtual reality community um, and trying to kind of pick and choose some things that, that made sense to me. And I, I think that a lot of what becomes a successful tool will be one that the community begins to embrace. And then uh, the create, whoever the creator of that tool is works very closely with that community to iterate and, and develop it over time. I don't think it will come fully formed 
from, from any particular company. In, in terms of timeline, um, I think it will be very, it will be very driven by uh, the device, um, new devices coming out, new device, new, the next you know, set of dev device generations. I think as long as our input systems and display systems keep changing as rapidly as they are, it's going to be very difficult for any particular tool to take hold because right now each new change in input uh, and each new change in display is so fundamental to the experience that it's uh, the structure of a tool is very hard to keep up. And so I think a, a truly mature tool like this will likely come maybe near the end of a device life cycle or maybe a few device life cycles on where uh, we start to see some convergence around input, especially input, um, but also, uh, also output technologies. And so I, I think we're probably still a ways off. Uh, and I think we're at this really exciting time when we're seeing lots of little sparks of innovation um, where we're gonna start to see how, um, how these tools come together. Okay, our time is up, and uh, we we had some really interesting questions in uh, in our chat. But I'm I'm sure that uh, uh, these friends can get in touch with you and uh, maybe yes, network uh, later with you. Thank you very much again. It was uh, really inspiring. Thank, Thank you. you.